Hello, everyone. I am extremely honored this evening to introduce to you a true friend of the Los Alamos Historical Society, Michael Etima. As you may know, we have an incredible collection of Native American fine art, uh, primarily uh, pottery in our Los Alamos Historical Society collections. I first met Michael a few years ago when we were looking for a top tier fine art appraiser. We engaged Michael for that assignment and were so impressed with his knowledge that we invited him to speak to our heritage partners at a noontime with the collections presentation where he uh, explained what we had received in a very fine donation from the Broad family. I know that you'll leave the lecture tonight enriched uh, with new understandings of Pueblo pottery and potters. Michael will talk about how Maria and Julian Martinez transformed pottery making at the Pueblo of San Ildefonso, not only with their black on black innovations, uh, but also with new pottery forms and modes of decoration. After decades of the dominance of blackware pottery, uh, at the Pueblo, the potter blue corn ushered in a new generation of innovations that opened the door for young potters to create their own styles. Michael is a member of the International Society of Appraisers and has 29 years of experience with American fine and decorative arts and antiques as a museum curator, a museum educator, and a museum director. In addition, he has 10 years of experience with Native American art and fine art of the American West as the Santa Fe Director of Medicine Man Gallery. If you'd like to learn more about Michael after tonight's lecture, and I know you will, uh, go to the website artappraisalsofsantafe.com. And it just gives me a delightful pleasure now to introduce Michael to you. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Appreciate the introduction. And uh, thank you also to Amy and Elizabeth and uh, for, for the invitation. And um, thank you uh, to the sponsors. As a former museum guy, I, I understand how important uh, sponsors and donors and supporters are to, to museum programs. And so uh, that is also very much appreciated. Um, I, I was telling Amy the other day that, um, that um, no, I'm probably going to need probably going to need help here again. Um, that I think the last time I gave a PowerPoint presentation was in 1997, and so <laughs> and so I'm a little I'm a little rusty on this. Um, but um, and Amy, at the moment, I'm not. Oh yes, here we go. Okay, and we went through this before. All right. Do you all see three generations of innovation in San Ildefonso pottery? Yes. Okay. All right, so we, we shall begin. So um, I want to start out actually with a few disclaimers. Um, first of all, I, 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 and I appreciate Don's kind words, uh, I don't consider myself an expert in Pueblo pottery in general or in Maria and family pottery specifically. Um, but I, as a, as a, as a, as a, uh, a gallery director and now an appraiser, I've handled hundreds and hundreds of, of pots and, um, and basically read through the secondary sources. Um, but I'm, I'm not here to just so you know what you're getting into. I'm not here to, uh, offer major original new insights. I haven't done, um, uh, uh my own kind of, uh, primary research. Um, but what I can do is kind of tell you the basic story. And I think it's a really fascinating cultural and artistic phenomenon. And I think it's definitely worth sharing. So in this case, um, I would ask that you sort of approach this talk uh, with me as being more of a journalist than a scholar. But I think you'll enjoy the story. What I will do, as good journalists do, is kind of question some of the things that we've been handed down uh, about, about the facts and the, and the implications of, of this story. My, um, my sources are, as I say, are secondary sources. 
Um, very quickly, um, the, the very famous Alice Marriott book came out in 1948 uh, on Maria. Um, she was a, an anthropologist, ethnographer, um, and she wasn't so much interested in pottery as she was interested in, um, in understanding how um, the influence of, of external factors changed the culture um, and the society of San Ildefonso Pueblo. And, and Maria was the, the jumping off point for that. And uh, she was particularly interested in two things. One is economic dislocations as, as subsistence farming was declining and also the rise of alcoholism um, on the Pueblo. Um, I, I'm going to talk just very, very little about either of those things. Um, and she presented this material basically as a novel. Um, she invented um, dialogue. Um, it was, of course, based on extensive interviews with Maria, but we don't know the degree to which she embellished uh, and filled in simply because um, in order to make it into a novel, it, uh, there had to be more continuity probably than Maria was able to give her in the interviews. And the, the second book is The Living Tradition of, of Maria Martinez by Susan Peterson, came out in 1997. Oh, and, and and Marriott's book, by the way, came out in 1948. So of course, Maria was, was still alive and, and basically at the peak of her production at that point. Um, Susan Peterson's book came out in 1997. It, it is somewhat, autobi somewhat biographical, but um, she was a little bit more, con more interested in, uh, in, in the pottery technique itself. And then Richard Spivey's book, um, this is the second edition, the enlarged edition that came out in 2003. And um, Richard Spivey not only interviewed Maria and other family members, he was also a close personal friend, particularly of Maria's son, Popo Vide. And so there are some, there's, he disagrees with <laughs> some of his predecessors in some, to some degree. And then the fourth book here is by Charles King and Richard Spivey, on the life and art of, of Tony Day, who was Maria's grandson. And we'll, we'll get to that toward the end. So Michael, so, Michael yes. if you can go up to slideshow and put it on presentation view, it will give us oh. a, a larger picture. Oh, okay. Slideshow. Okay. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, pre Presenter view. Uh, yes. There we go. Right. Is that right? Is that right? Except that I can't now see my notes. Mm. Okay, there you go. Can hit exit. Okay. Hmm. Is this okay? Yeah, because I know the pictures are very small. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's good. All right. Um, okay. So, um, I also relied on a on a handful of of articles. Um, written over the years, mostly recently. Um, most importantly, a, a 2019 article in El Palacio magazine um, written by Bruce Bernstein, Eric Fender, and Russell Sanchez. And Fender and Sanchez are, are contemporary uh, San Ildefonso potters. And it accompanied an exhibition that looked at the history of San Ildefonso pottery from the point of view of the community rather than the Anglo curators and collectors who, who usually write about it. So it's, it's an important, important article to read. But in general, given the sources of the story I'm going to tell you, um, it's basically from an outsider's, a white outsider's point of view. So, so keep that in mind. But I will be kind of questioning, as I said, some of the, some of the things that are, that are presented in these, in these books and articles. Hey, well, if, uh, if we're talking about kind of a, a, a big change or revolution, so-called in Pueblo pottery, we need to know a little bit about what came before, uh, before Maria. And, um, and this oh, is um, basically a, a very quick chronology. Uh, and I don't go back too far, basically just to the 18th century. Whoop. So this is, um, this is called San Ildefonso Black and White, and it was prevalent from about the mid 18th century up to the 1880s or so. And uh, one of the things that I'm, that I'm going to talk about a little more and want to point out is, is if you look at this decoration, which is absolutely wonderful, kind of very, uh, has a lot of movement and activity and life to it. 
Um, but you also see that it's not very precise. And so there, you know, for example, around the, there's different spacing, um, things are different lengths. Some of the lines are kind of crooked, um, doesn't all add up. Um, and we'll, as I say, I'll talk about that a little more and, and, and why I'm focusing on that. Um, Samuel Defonso Black on red pottery um, started in the mid 19th century. And it was, it was the least prevalent kind of pottery at San Alfonso Pueblo. Um, and basically discontinued with the death of, uh, of a important potter um, named Tonita uh, Roybal in, um, at, at her death in 1945. Marie and Julian actually made some of this type of pottery, a little bit, not very much. And then at the, at the end of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, the most prevalent type San Ildefonso polychrome. And polychrome in, in virtually every case was red and black decoration on a, on a white slipped ground. So you paint on the white ground. But one of the things that I really wanna look at here in tracing these changes is, uh, is a really very simple idea. I'm trained as a material culture historian or cultural historian. And one of the tenets of that, um, of that field is that objects um, in various ways in the way they look or in the way they're made or both, usually both, uh, can be markers of, of cultural change. And so that's, that's really kind of the theme I want to look at here. Particularly what I want to look at is, is, is two things. Um, one, is, one is the, the um, this movement from not precise decoration like this, you know, a little bit of unevenness, different lengths, again, you know, different angles and different spacing and so on, to high level of precision, and then kind of to, it, it uh, almost uh, uh, an unbelievable uh, fascination with everything being absolutely precise. And the other thing is also just innovation, new new colors, new techniques, uh, new design ideas, and what that might say about the culture um, of San Ildefonso. Uh, over really just three generations from Maria to Maria's son to her grandson. And then as Don mentioned, Blue Corn, who was a contemporary of Maria's son, Pocobi Day. Okay, so to understand a little bit more about Maria, let's look at really who she is. So for, for someone who um, who lived through 80% of the 20th century and was famous as she is, um, there's a whole lot we don't really know about her, um, including uh, any certainty about the date she was born. Um, it's, uh, Marriott thought it was in the early 1880s. Um, it's variously been identified as 1881, 1884. The currently most accepted date for her birth is 1887. And so that's kind of what we're going with. Um, and um, that was being bantered around when Richard Spivey wrote his book. And, and, um, and he, is quite, he was quite certain that 1887 is the correct date, although the exact date is not really that important in understanding, in understanding Maria. But Maria was the second daughter of Reyes Peña Montoya and Tomas Montoya at San Ildefonso Pueblo. Um, her maternal aunt, Nicolasa Peña Montoya, was um, considered a very skilled potter at San Ildefonso. Um, and, uh, and she did, um, she did these, um, here, let me go back. She did these polychrome wares um, and was well known for them. Um, but most of the pottery made at San Ildefonso at the time uh, were utilitarian wares. Uh, women made their own pottery for their own use or the family's use. They also made some pottery to sell or excuse me, not to sell, but rather to trade with other Pueblos. So it wasn't something that was being made for, um, for sale to, to the public. Occasionally, the curio traders from Santa Fe would come through the Pueblos and they would buy up stuff. Uh, but that was not a significant source of revenue for the, for the Pueblo potters, um, nor was it really a significant means of exposure uh, for their work. 
But uh, Maria and her sisters, um, particularly Maximiliana, generally called Anna and Desideria, Maximiliana was older, Desideria was uh, the next younger, so Maria was two in line um, of five daughters. Um, they were very interested in learning pottery as, as, as young girls. Uh, their mother didn't particularly encourage it uh, because she, <laughs> she apparently didn't want them bothering her sister. Um, but um, but uh, uh, Nicolasa was willing to teach them. And uh, as is the case with, with Pueblo potters, particularly of that time, um, the way you learn is not by being actively taught, but simply by watching and watching and watching and watching. And then maybe when you start having the person you're watching critique your pottery. So it's, it's, uh, um, it's, it's very much a, um, it's, it's almost like being self-taught with, um, with some critique and encouragement, uh, but by watching, watching the best potters. So Maria probably also learned in that way um, by watching Martina and Florentino Montoya, who were, um, they were of her parents' generation. Um, and they were considered, um, at least by, by modern day collectors and curators as the best potters at San Alfonso of their generation. Um, one of my questions is, uh, did other potters at San Alfonso consider them the best? It's, it's probably likely. Um, but here we already see, uh, if you remember that black on white jar, um, much more precise lines, much more precise spacing, um, and, and, um, and good, strong, bold designs. Um, so it's, it's likely that this desire for um, technical proficiency and accuracy is, is already taking root. Where it comes from, is a question in my mind. Um, I'm not sure we're ever going to be able to answer that. Is it an Anglo influence, even already in the in the late 1800s when these pots were probably made, um, or is it is it part of Anglo culture, kind of bleeding into into um, to native art? But uh, Maria, when she started making pottery on her own. Um, but probably at, at, when she probably when she um, left the Santa Fe Indian School around 1899, she was there for a year or two. Um, started making pottery, um, and she was she was very interested in it. Um, she became proficient quite quickly. Um, but Maria never decorated her own pottery, um, except for maybe a few um, experiments or, or or demonstration pieces. Um, early on, when she started, um, Maria's uh, sister and brother-in-law, particularly her brother-in-law, Crescencio Montoya, um, or sorry, Crescencio Mantinas, um, uh, decorated her pot. And this is, this is a pot that, that Anna, her older sister and her brother-in-law, Crescencio made really remarkably, beautifully decorated pot. And again, you know, it, even more increased precision um, and inventiveness, um, even so, some particularly this kind of scroll pattern, which is very unusual, um, and and <laughs> actually this these these crosses too, which look like they're taken from Navajo rugs, and maybe indeed they were, um, but um, but a high level of quality as a uh, uh, you know by by um, Anglo standards, uh, but this is who she was learning from, and this is who she was watching. Hey, now we introduce Julian, and I'm, I'm going to use um, I'm going to use the, the English version of his name as opposed to Julian um, uh, or Pocano, uh, which was his his Tewa name. Um, but um, oh, and, and by the way, um, you know, of course, Tewa was their first language. Spanish was their second language. English was their third language. Um, but um, Maria and, and Julian, uh, according to, to Marriott, started spending a lot of time together about 1899. And, um, and according to Marriott, 
she took a long time to um, decide whom to marry, even though she was, she was still very young. She was only a teenager. Uh, that was not unusual. Um, and, and eventually, kind of against the advice of her parents, decided she wanted to marry Julian. Um, they actually had a child, their first son, Adam, in 1903. Um, in, in 1904, um, Julian came to her and said that he had invite, he was, had been invited along with other Tewa men um, to perform dances at the St. Louis World's Fair and asked if she would go along. And she did. And so they were married in the morning, got on the train with their baby Adam in the afternoon and went off to, to the World's Fair for a couple of months. Um, Julian did the dances and, um, and Maria made pottery. She said she didn't make anything very significant, small things, um, probably not much to sell, but it was basically a demonstration. But that was, that was the, the story of them getting together. And for the rest of Julian's life, they were absolutely inseparable partners in, in, every, in every way according to all of the sources. Oh, and by the way, um, I, I, I don't know this for sure, but this is probably a photograph that was taken at the St. Louis World's Fair of them. Um, so just about the time, just so probably in 1904, time of their marriage. These photographs were taken at the Museum of New Mexico, probably about 1910. So they're a little, they're a little bit older. Okay, let's back up a little bit and just look at, at, the, at the village, at the Pueblo of San Ildefonso. Um, this, is, this is the east entrance um, taken in 1911. This, of course, is the church. This was taken in 1899. Uh, but at the turn of the century, um, San Ildefonso, like most of the Pueblos, had lost the vast majority of their population to disease, primarily, um, and uh, other economic dislocations. Um, it was probably somewhere around 150 people in 1900. I've read conflicting accounts. Um, and af apparently after the turn of the century, it fell below 100 at one point. So it was a very small village, relatively poor, um, almost completely dependent on subsistence farming. So they had definitely had good and bad years. Um, and Marriott tells the story of the disastrous spring of 1907. Um, when, when there were very late frosts that kept, um, that, that delayed planting. And then uh, once, the, once the weather got good, there was a tremendous amount of flooding um, due to un, unusual rains. And the flooding actually apparently was caused by um, clear cutting that had been done in the mountains above, uh, above the, the Rio Grande. And um, and the flooding kept um, destroying the, the ruined the fields and destroyed the acequias and uh, and caused a, a huge amount of amount of effort and so the the collective well being of the of the and that went on for several years collective well being of the pueblo was was greatly greatly reduced but it was also in 1907 that um, Edgar Lee Hewitt founded the School of American Archaeology which is now called the School for Advanced Research here in Santa Fe. Two years later, he founded the Museum of New Mexico. And um, in, the, in the School of Archaeology, of American Archaeology's first field season in 1907, they started excavating in the Pajarito Plateau. And um, the, the permission to dig and to, uh, um, was granted by Waima was the, then the governor of San Ildefonso Pueblo. An unusual sort of thing, um, a very generous gesture as far as the, the archeologists were concerned. We don't really know what motivated him to do that. He didn't have to do that. Um, and um, the, um, the archeologists also asked for, for him and a couple other Pueblos to provide some, some manual labor, which he also granted. Um, and uh, Julian was one of those people who signed on the labor, and there he is right there. Um, so this was, this was obviously a, a windfall for, for the workers because they were able to earn money to replace the crops that were being destroyed uh, or that weren't growing. And, 
And so it was, um, yeah, it was, it was very much accepted. And maybe that's why Wayman did it. We, we don't really know. Um, but he, uh, contrary to what one would, what one would think of as, as, uh, uh, you know, normal behavior for a very conservative Pueblo, he let people in to basically dig their graves to, you know, disturb old houses, to do all kinds of things that probably generally didn't sit well with the Pueblos. Um, but this did give um, members of the Pueblo some economic opportunity. So um, Julian was hired, and we don't know the exact date of this photo, but it's 1978, nine, probably 10. Um, but Julian was rehired for the second field season, for the second dig in 1908. And this time the, the workers' families were invited to come along and, and Maria did. Um, she didn't make pottery that summer, uh, but Hewitt knew that she was a skilled potter and showed her sherds from an excavation and uh, asked her if she could recreate the pottery type and the designs. Um, and she, she was happy to try. She said you didn't know how to make that kind of pottery and she could not paint the pottery. So they suggested perhaps that, that Julian could do that. What she was shown, what they were shown was, um, is, is not exactly known. It's somewhat contested. And this, the, <laughs> this detail, the reason that this detail is important will become apparent in a, in a little bit. But, um, uh, Marriott says that it was a dark gray pottery with fine black lines. Spivey says that it was Rio Grande biscuit wear, which is black on cream. And this is simply in terms of, um, of, the, of the amount of sherds, uh, various types, this is the most likely candidate. Um, and, but then um, Bruce Bernstein and his and the, the two Pueblo potters who wrote the article in El Palacio in 2019 said it was capo black on black. Um, the problem is that, um, and this is this is another example of of just there's so little that we know. Even this didn't happen that long ago. Um, there is no capo black on black. Um, even though Kenneth Chapman, um, who was one of Hewitt's right-hand men, said that he found experiments that suggested that they were um, that they were they were looking at black on black in in prehistoric times. So we don't really know the answer to that until the sherds that Chapman was talking about show up. Um, it seems that the most likely um, type of pottery sure that they were looking at was this Rio Grande biscuit ware. So, uh, so by this time, 1907, 1908, uh, Julian was painting Maria's pottery. We don't know how he started that. Um, if he started that before or after he started painting on paper. Um, we do know that, um, that, uh, uh, that the Museum of Mexico people, Hewitt and Chapman, probably gave him paints and, and uh, Marriott says that he, um, he was asked to copy designs that they found, um, likely true. Um, but how he started working with Murray or exactly when we don't really know. But, um, but in, the, in the winter of, of um, excuse me, in, in the, during the, um, the excavation, the field season in 1908, and this episode of the Sherd, um, now a mythical episode, um, apparently, according to Marriott, um, Edgar Lee Hewitt asked uh, Maria to, as I said, to, to copy this Sherd. And so over the winter, apparently she made five bowls and Julian painted his version of the designs that they found on the shirt or shirts. And, um, and then the next summer, Maria presented three of the bowls to Hewitt and Chapman, and they were very pleased with the results and they bought them. Um, but apparently two of the bowls had been ruined in the fire. And by ruined, um, she meant that 
um, they had turned completely black. And so she was embarrassed by them and um, because they didn't show the, the black on the cream, presumably, designs. And so she, she just kept those, she, she hid those from Hewitt. Um, and we'll get back to that in a minute again. So in the next field season, um, uh, Hewitt suggested that Maria stay home and produce pots for Julian to decorate when he got back from the field work in the fall. And, and that's what she did. And she did it because the promise was that the Museum of New Mexico would start selling the pottery. So here, in addition to, um, to, to wage paying jobs for San Ildefonso men, um, the Museum of New Mexico is offering to um, help Marie and Julian earn some money by selling pottery. And, uh, and in fact, Maria said in, in one of the interviews that it was Dr. Hewitt who got me interested in pottery, by which she meant got her interested in making pottery to sell. And that's what they did. Um, he approached Maria probably because she was already known as an excellent potter in, uh, among the Pueblo, uh, within the Pueblo. Um, and, um, and he very much approved of the kind of, of work that, that, he that she was doing um, and Julian's decoration. And so, um, so that, that deal was struck um, in informally, of course. So, but um, here's the kind of, of pottery that Marie and Julian were making in that first decade of the 20th century. These are probably a little later, but they're, they're making polychrome pottery. But you can see now uh, the amazing precision um, of, the, of the painting, of Julian's painting. Also, these are very large jars and uh, they're very difficult to make by the coil method. And um, Maria became very, very skilled at, at making very large jars. And we'll, we'll see a few more. But her, her shapes were, were very symmetrical, very graceful. Um, she was known as the best polisher, and I'll explain what that means in a bit, but it's important to the creation of, of black on black pottery particularly. And um, she was able to create, create really smooth surfaces that fired without any polish marks or streaking. Um, so, so by Anglo standards and possibly by, uh, by native standards, um, she was considered to be one of the most skilled potters in, in the Pueblo um, long about 1910. And Julian was a perfectionist. Um, from the earliest days of his painting, um, pottery decorating, he, he created really intricate, perfectly symmetrical designs with really fine, accurate lines. Um, again, if that was something innate to him, that's just what he wanted to do, and he was driven to do that for his own reasons, or if now this is creeping um, Anglo influence coming in, I'm, again, I'm not sure that we're ever going to know that, but that's, that is a question. Um, and they, had, they did have some rivals at the, at the Pueblo, but, um, but basically they were, considered, they were considered among the best, and here are some, some early... Um, we, we can, or some early examples of their polychrome work from the period of probably about 1910 into the 1920s. Uh, we might surmise that this is, a, is an early piece. It's a little coarser, uh, but then we start having extremely fine um, designs and decoration, very complicated decoration, uh, which they did early on, which they largely had to abandon, I think probably for economic reasons. They needed to produce a lot of pottery. Let's make it a little simpler so we can produce more of it faster. And here's some really exceptional pieces. Again, a fairly early one, probably um, two from the 1920s. Um, and just <laughs> as a note, this, this plate with the kosharis, this actually looks very much like one of Julian's paintings, uh, his watercolor paintings on paper. Uh, and uh, this pot, this plate, I should say, about 15 years ago, sold for about $150,000. Um, very, the early polychrome stuff is very deserved. I have to put that in because I'm an art appraiser. Um, all right, so um, 
the Museum of New Mexico, this is Edgar Lee Hewitt and Kenneth Chapman, um, they of course were in the business of studying and displaying native art and artifacts, but their interest specifically in Marie and Julian and their pottery was part of Museum of New Mexico's efforts to improve, and that word is in quotes, the quality of Pueblo pottery in general. Um, and they, they saw Marie and Julian as being highly skilled potteries, potters who they would hold up as examples to other potters about how to do it. But they were kind of conflicted about what high quality meant or what improve meant. On one hand, um, as anthropologists, um, actually Chapman was an artist rather than anthropologist, but um, they were working together on the same projects. Um, uh, they were they were of a time when um, they viewed Native Americans as basically windows into into the human past. So they they assumed that that Native Americans were um, and and their culture and practices were coming from eons ago. And the more that um, they were defiled by um, by um, the practices of the dominant culture, the farther away they got. So they wanted to kind of push everything back to pre-contact times to understand uh, what they thought those cultures were like before, before European intervention. Um, but on the other hand, um, they had a genuine interest in, in the welfare of, of Pueblo people. And um, they, they did look for ways um, to promote um, the, the, the Pueblo's lot in life economically, um, if not culturally. And, um, and one of the ways that they decided they could do this was by quote unquote, improving their pottery and making it saleable to the public. So on one hand, they wanted this kind of pre-contact vision of Pueblo pottery. On the other hand, they wanted to make something that was, that was uh, it was acceptable and, and could be in demand by, uh, by Anglo collectors. And so they generally, their definition of quality was what Anglo people were after, which is, which is, which is, uh, which is perfection, basically, which is highly symmetrical forms, very graceful forms, which is highly precise painting, um, and, uh, and, uh, and lightness of form, thin walled pottery. These were the criteria that kind of the Anglos applied to this pottery. And that's what, that's what they were promoting. And in fact, they had a, they had a, a small grant for a while um, to purchase Pueblo pottery for the Museum of New Mexico. And what they would do is, is invite potters to, to bring their pottery in and they would pick the pieces that they thought were best. They would ask what the potter wanted for them and then offer maybe 25% more than the asking price as a way of kind of reinforcing that, yes, this is what we want to see. We don't wanna see this other thing. The thing we're paying for is, is what we wanna see in the future. And so in that way, they started to, to manipulate um, uh, uh, what the artists were doing uh, with generally good intentions, but it was a very paternalistic kind of relationship. And, um, you know, they, these, these guys felt that, you know, as scholars and also as white men, I'm sure, uh, implicitly, um, they were the rightful arbiters of quality, not the artists themselves. Uh, they didn't ask the artists what they thought was high quality. They, they knew what they wanted to see. And so that's what they, that's what they demanded. That's what they pay for. And that's what they that's what they reinforced. And in fact, the you know the the Indian market is um, is the um, started with this way in this way that it was it was really conceived as a way to um, to get Pueblo pottery out there to the public and by awarding prizes and by um, by purchasing pottery uh, the museum would reinforce the qualities they wanted to see in the pottery. Okay, here's Marie and Julian again around, around 1910. So after the field season of 1909, Hewitt um, at the museum offered Julian a job as janitor of the museum. And, um, and the museum in, in, in that year had become uh, the home of the brand new museum of New Mexico. Um, they stayed for 
two to three years, not exactly sure how long that was, but Julian was still working um, on excava whoops, so working on excavations in 1910. Here he is at, at Bandelier. Um, so Julian would uh, work as a janitor during the day and Maria would make pottery and occasionally demonstrate for the public. And they would kind of, they were in some senses living uh, exhibits um, from time to time in the museum. And, um, and then Julian would, after he was done with his, his tasks during the day, he would paint the pottery in the evening and the museum continued to sell it. Um, and it was during this time uh, when they were living at the museum that at the Palace of the Governors that according to Marriott, she began to sell to at least one curio dealer in Santa Fe. And between the museum and the curio dealer, demand for their pottery, their polychrome pottery, quickly outstripped supply. And her reputation was, her reputation, Julian kind of got left in the dust, but her reputation was growing very quickly. Um, and it began to, to outstrip the potters, the other potters in the Pueblo. And, uh, but chances are that um, the pottery made by Maria's sisters and other potters at the Pueblo were included um, in, the, in the material they sold in Santa Fe, just to keep the supply going. So um, what's going on here is that, of course, Hewitt, for his own personal, professional reasons, um, gave Maria and Julian an opportunity, an economic opportunity, um, which they took and they responded on their own terms. Uh, he didn't tell them what to make, except again, by kind of reinforcing, well, okay, we'll pay more for this, we'll pay less for that. So there's a little bit of coercion there, but basically they, they responded on their own terms with skills that they were very proud of. And, and fortunately, those skills, which are, again, so sort of symmetry and lightness and precision, those skills were um, that they that they prided themselves in were also what the market was, was looking for. So there was a happy union there. And here's Maria and Julian demonstrating, at least for a photographer uh, in the courtyard of the palace of the governors. And here they are a little bit later back at the Pueblo. So it's, uh, so let's talk about a little bit about the invention of the black on black pottery. So it's not known for certain how they came up with the idea. Um, we do know that Maria, um, in the time she was working at the palace, that she was making some polished uh, but undecorated black pots. And so that was not something that was done at San Ildefonso at the time. That was, it was something that was being done at um, Santa Clara and Okeowinge, but, but not at San Ildefonso at the time. But she, we know she did make some of those. And, um, and because, again, demand was, was pretty good, according to Marriott, um, just to, in order to continue making sales, um, and this may be, well be a apocryphal story, but apparently she they um, they got they took the two root bowls that had been ruined that they made for Edgar Hewitt, but had gotten smoked and blackened, and she thought ruined, and they brought them to the curio dealer, and he really liked them, and in that way. Um, they got the idea for the black on black, but it probably is apocryphal because six or seven years passed from the time of this supposed incident until they created their first documented black on black. So I find that story somewhat suspicious. Um, Bernstein, Sanchez, and Fender in their El Palacio articles say it was the shirt that Hewitt gave to Maria and that it was black on black and Julian took it from there. Um, although Chapman wrote, as I mentioned, that there was evidence that there were such experiments in the archaeological record, um, it's impossible, maybe without going through the millions of sherds at the Laboratory of Anthropology to identify what exactly he was talking about. Um, so, I, I, you know, the origin story of the black on black, black is really relegated to myth. Um, and in myth in the sense that it's a very interesting and useful metaphor. Um, and so the, the, the heart of it uh, bears some truth, but the facts, are, the facts are questionable. I don't think we'll ever really know exactly what that shirt was um, or exactly how they came up with it. I think the most logical explanation is that simply Julian came up with it with the idea um, after they started making plain black pottery. And um, you know, he was a painter. He wanted to <laughs> he wanted to paint it. Um, and also, you know, Marriott suggests, and and I think there's good evidence for this that Julian was an experimenter and an innovator, just kind of innately. 
Um, he, he liked to try new things. And Maria's a little more cautious and conservative. For example, when they demonstrated at the, at the New York World's Fair, in, um, or excuse me, the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, um, Maria was given the opportunity to fire some of her pottery in an electric kiln. And Julian wanted to do it. But Maria, Maria thought that, well, if, if she doesn't fire in the traditional way, it's not real San Ildefonso pottery anymore. And so, um, so there's, there's some evidence that, um, that Julian just liked to try stuff out. And um, I think that's the most logical explanation for it. Uh, the first attempts at the black on black were a little awkward. Um, so what they what Julian did was was have Maria um, put slip, which is liquefied clay, over the whole surface, the whole exterior surface of the pot, and then he would draw the design, and then she was to go back and polish with a stone just the just the parts within the design. This is definitely the hard way to do it. Um, and it didn't work terribly well. It, um, you know, the edges weren't sharp and, and it, they made several of these, but um, they were not thrilled with it. Well, very quickly they realized that um, if she polishes the whole pot and then Julian goes back and paints a design on it, uh, the painted parts will be matte or not shiny. And the polished parts of course will, will stay shiny. And he quickly learned to do this in two ways. One is um, to paint a positive design. Uh, in other words, the design elements are what is what is are, are what is painted. So, for example, this little triangular motif, which is very common in Pueblo pottery from various pueblos, um, is painted in in liquefied clay on the pot on the polished pot and then fired. And, but then he, he quickly developed this negative design where you see that the part that remains polished is the, is the figure. So it's not the figure that's been painted with the matte slip, it's everything around it. And so he would do these in bands rather than cover the whole pot. And so those are the two basic um, design techniques that, that he continued to use uh, for the rest of his life and, and continued well after, well after him. Okay, let's very quickly, we're running out of time here. Let's very quickly look at, at the process. Um, the, uh, of course, the, the clays are, are natural local clays dug on the, on the Pueblo land. Um, so here's Julian digging out from the side of a hill. And then the, the clay has to be pulverized and soaked and strained and pulverized and soaked and strained and pulverized and soaked and strained. It's a very, very laborious process. And, um, and then the, the clay is kneaded and, and temper or frit. In this case, they used uh, vol pajarito volcanic ash, um, very fine quartz material. And here Maria is mixing it into uh, a bunch of clay and knead it and knead it and knead it over and over again to get out, to, to make the consistency, uh, to make it consistent uh, and also to get out any air. And then she makes, you can see here, a, kind of a pancake um, of clay to form the bottom of the pot. And here she's putting it in a puki, uh, which is a, basically just a shallow dish that helps curve the pot upward and, and helps uh, start raising the, the walls of the pot. And here she is making coils of clay, which she will add to the rim and build it up. And there she's, she's starting to build from the puki. And there she's got her more or less uh, fully formed pot, which she has, and she has very, very hard to see, probably a little piece of gourd that she uses to shape uh, the pot and raise the walls and get the shape that she wants. And then she lets that dry. And then she applies liquid clay called slip to it, and while that slip is still moist, she polishes it. Whoop, polishes it with a stone. You can see right there. And Maria was an awesome polisher. Um, she was considered uh, one of the best two or three people in the pueblo at, at polishing to get absolutely no polish marks. Um, if you think about it and study pottery, um, it's astonishing that anybody can do that and make a completely smooth 
surface with no marks uh, by using a stone on a wet clay. And then here's Julian with a polished pot. He's painting on the design. And Maria starting to stack, or she is stacking the pots on a bed of juniper. It's laid out in a nice symmetrical fashion with the pots upside down on top. And then they're covered with large old pot shards or now most potters use sheet metal of various kinds. Um, then cow pies or some kind of manure is basically uh, used to encase the pottery. And then toward the end of the firing, um, the fire, in order to make the black wear, the fire is smothered with pulverized manure. And that's what Maria is tending here. So if any smoke starts leaking out, um, they close the little gap with the sticks. And, um, and uh, that is what smokes the pottery. And what happens actually is, uh, is two things. One is that um, with, with air not allowed to get into the firing, um, it's what potters call a reduction firing, which means that that oxygen in the materials gets pulled out. And what this does in, this, in the red clay that they used, which is high in iron, it, it pulls oxygen, iron, oxygen molecules, uh, excuse me, atoms um, out of the ferric oxide um, rust, basically red rust, and reduces it to ferrous oxide, which will turn black. And also it deposits, um, it deposits uh, uh, carbon into the surface of the pottery. And so here's Julian with the same sticks, taking the finished pots out of the fire and then they, they rub them, rub the ash off and polish them with a the cloth and they're ready to go. So, and here they are at the end of that demonstration. That was done in the 1930s for the Museum of New Mexico. Um, so Julian's, um, Julian innovated um, it really in, in two ways. One is by um, trading these incredibly precise designs and the other is by coming up with entirely new designs. So, so things like this, um, he was using mostly traditional motifs that he made very precise kind of cleaned up um, and use probably in new combinations, but, but uh, tr more traditional patterns. Um, and, but then he, he invented several new things, the most famous of which were the avenue pattern and the avenue, the water serpent, a uh, very important symbol in Pueblo culture. Um, it's on rock art all over New Mexico. Um, so he adapted this, he was the first to adapt this to, to pottery. Um, and also, his repeating feather pattern, which is um, often called membrace feather, although I've not been able to, to identify a membrace source for this, but it's possible, um, or, or where he would have seen it if it is membrace, but he developed this band of, of radiating feathers or band of parallel feathers on the, on the pots. This one, by the way, this plate is in the, in the, in the collections of the Los Alamos Historical Society and was part of the, the gift that Don mentioned. Um, and then Maria's, Maria also innovated, uh, even though she was a little more conservative, she did make more traditional shapes. This is like the, this is the same shape of this bulbous black on white San Ildefonso pottery from the 18th century, although this one of course is black on black. This is a water jar type, which is a lot more popular at Santa Clara, neighbor Pueblo, but um, it was done in the late 19th and early 20th century at San Ildefonso, and then kind of an abbreviated version of that. Um, she did some forms that weren't traditional to San Ildefonso, particularly these tall vases and, and wedding vases. Maria didn't do a lot of wedding vases. They're, they're fairly rare. These tall, va tall neck vases, though, she, um, she did a lot more as time went on. She did a lot with uh, uh, later in her career. But mainly what she developed were these um, very simple, elegant, but very simple designs um, of pots that basically have no flaring rims and no necks. And one could surmise that she did this because they're faster and easier to make than, than pieces like that. And um, 
she was, um, you know, her pottery was in huge demand. And so to meet that demand, um, she had to find ways to, to simplify. And, and that is probably why she did that. And it's also probably why Julian started making much simpler designs. I mean, he went from this and this to these. And, uh, and, um, and the other thing Maria did a lot of were plates. She did far more plates, well, she did far more pottery in general, but far more plates, particularly than, than other potters. Um, and she did some very large ones up to, uh, the largest ones are about 15 inches or so. And they're very difficult to make the big ones because they tend to warp in the fire. So to get a, to get a good plate, you have to have perfectly mixed clay and you have to know how to control the fire um, and the temperature. And you can see there, <laughs> there weren't any thermometers in that fire. Um, so you, you have to have great experience to, to be able to, to make something like that. Uh, and she was extremely skilled at it. And uh, another thing that they, they innovated, and I haven't found any other precedents for this, although I, I won't say that there aren't any, but they did a, a, some buff on red. So remember there was black on red, San Aldefonso pottery, but uh, which they did a tiny, tiny little bit of, um, but they did some buff on red. So instead of, instead of the black paint, which was made from plant material, um, they actually used buff clay to, to make these designs. So another little innovation. And one of the reasons that Maria was so prolific was that she, um, whoops, is that she worked with her sisters. And so she had four sisters. This is the youngest, Clara. And this is Desideria, that's Maria. That's her older sister, Anna, and then Juanita. And they all worked with her um, from time to time to varying degrees. Of course, they had their own families and their own responsibilities. And they made their own pottery under their own names to a limited degree. It was Clara who uh, was the youngest who, uh, who lived with Maria and was her constant companion. Um, and polished a lot of Maria's pottery, and she was considered at least as good a polisher as um, as Maria. And um, and so so what's going on here is that this is not just the work of Maria who gets all the credit, and then Julian who gets some credit, but it was really a family enterprise through through most of Maria's life, uh, with Clara being the primary partner. But um, the black on black was so immediately successful among collectors, among the anthropologists. It was so unusual. Nobody had seen this before. Um, it, um, it had this amazing luster, which most polo pottery did not. Um, the surfaces were absolutely perfectly smooth and gleaming and it just absolutely caught on instantly. And so it, 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 it made uh, Maria and, and Julian um, actually, in, in the terms of the Pueblo in the 1930s, quite wealthy. Um, and, and even <laughs> they, they earned a good living even compared to a lot of Anglo people, earned a very good living. And Maria felt that it was her obligation to share that with, at first, with other potters at the Pueblo, um, and, uh, and then also with people outside the Pueblo. So here she is teaching a pottery class at San Ildefonso in 1935. She also taught at um, Santa Fe Indian School on a, not on a regular basis, but she did, she did workshops there, I guess we would call them now. Uh, but she, she felt that it was very important to share her skill. And of course, we're talking about someone from a culture who, um, that does not value the individual above the community. The individual isn't supposed to be um, um, singled out or elevated uh, but there was no, no way that Maria could entirely avoid that. So her response was to basically share it with anybody who wanted to know. And in that way, um, she, um, she uh, uh, was able to not just improve her own circumstances, but to improve the circumstances of a lot of other potters. New potters came in because they were able to make some decent money doing it. And the potters who were already working switched over to black on black because, um, because they, um, uh, they could make a lot more money that way. So, uh, so because of the demand for black on black, the, um, basically the polychrome tradition went away. I mean, Maria and Julian 
pretty much killed it. Um, probably by about 1930, there was hardly any any um, any polychrome pottery being made there anymore. Um, but um, as far as the Pueblo was concerned, it was it was a very good thing because they were doing very well. So unfortunately, in 1943, alcohol claimed the life of Julian. And um, Maria was as understandably bereft, um, but um, the family rather gathered around, rallied around. Um, uh, their oldest son, Adam, started um, working with the, gathering the clay and preparing the clay with Maria. And his wife, um, Santana Roybal Martinez, um, did the painting for Maria's pottery. And there she is later in life painting. Here's, this is actually their wedding picture from about 1925. And, uh, but uh, Santana and Maria hewed very closely, very, very closely to the designs that, that Julian had developed. And so visually they're indistinguishable. Fortunately, they were signing pottery starting in the 1920s. So we know who the painter was in, in almost every case. Um, so this is, um, just to look at this, you wouldn't know if it was Julian or if it was Santana um, or later even Popovi Day. Um, here are some, throw this in because this is, um, these are in the collections of the, of the Historical Society. Um, and these are plain wares. And this was pr probably a set, we, they're a set of plates and a couple of salad type bowls. And it was probably a salad set that uh, Marie and Santana made, but they did these, these salad sets undecorated because they anticipated them being used. And indeed, um, if you could see this little salad plate closely, you see it's all scratched up. And so um, whoever at Los Alamos purchased it, um, Don can tell you that, um, they actually used them. So this was generally not functional wear, but in some cases um, people did actually, did actually use them. So on to kind of the next phase of Maria's career. So about, about 1954, uh, at Maria's urging, her third son, third of four sons, Popovi Day, um, started, who, who was born um, Antonio or Anthony uh, Martinez, he started um, painting some of Maria's pottery. He was a painter, like his father, he painted on paper. He actually attended uh, Santa Fe Indian School and studied under Dorothy Dunn. He also went to another art school in Santa Fe studying with Joseph Bakos. Um, and, um, in, uh, and so he, he considered himself as a profession, uh, his profession as a painter. Um, he, was, uh, he was drafted into the army in 1944 and he was actually assigned to Los Alamos to the special engineering detachment um, making uh, what Richard Spivey calls fine instruments. I'm not sure exactly what that would be, but he did work at Los Alamos. And, um, and then after the war, he returned to painting and he and his wife in 1948 opened a gallery at the, uh, at the Pueblo and they sold all kinds, not only the family's work, but all kinds of, of Indian arts. Um, and about 1956, Marie was very pleased with his painting. He was considered at least as good a painter as his father, probably better. Um, 1956, he basically replaced Santana as the painter and the designer and decorator of Maria's pottery. Santana and Adam um, continued to make pottery on their own. Um, but, but like Santana with Maria, Popovi was very faithful to the patterns that his father um, developed. Um, and he, he felt that it was not his pottery, it was Maria's pottery. And so he didn't have the right to try to get her to change it. Nevertheless, he did have a few of his own ideas and he seemed to have this natural impulse toward innovation. Um, so he, he, there were a, a couple of color innovations that he really worked on. And one, was, one is called by collectors gunmetal. And this is when the, that, hard shiny black surface turns into this very lustrous metallic like finish. And it, it, it happens at a very specific temperature in the firing. 
So you have to be very good at, in order to get this in a predictable way, you have to be extremely skilled at knowing um, when, to, um, when to stop the fire. If it, um, if it doesn't get to the right temperature, it won't turn this metal color. If it gets too hot um, very easily, it will simply turn dull gray and it, it won't look nice at all. So, and he became very, very skilled at, at inducing this gunmetal color. He also developed something that collectors now call sienna. He referred to as caramel. And this is a curious um, process of refiring the pottery. Um, so it's in the first firing, it's turned black completely. And then in the second firing, um, the fire is not smothered. And so the reduction firing doesn't take place and much of the carbon um, is burned off and the, and the uh, ferrous oxide is reoxidized to a certain degree, but it doesn't turn it back to red. It turns it to something from kind of a terracotta color like this to almost orange, like in this pot. And then he also developed this technique, um, which is insanely difficult um, of, of partially refiring the pot. So again, fire the whole thing black and then refire it um, to turn the black back into orange or terracotta. But in order to do that, he has to cover the things he, the parts he wants to remain black and he covered them with ash. And how he got this band, I have no idea. But um, he didn't, didn't do a lot of these because they were so difficult. Second firing is very dangerous. He loses a lot of pots in the fire. Um, but it's an absolutely remarkable innovation from somebody who basically said, no, this is Maria's pottery. I, I don't have the right to tell her what to do. Um, so this is clearly some impulse within him. But um, the thing that, one of the things that Popovi is best known for is, is returning with Maria to polychrome pottery. And, um, and again, to the very elaborate designs that um, similar to what his father made. Um, and, and larger pots again. So this was clearly a passion of, of Popovi's. Okay, now very quickly, I know I'm over time here. We're gonna zoom through um, two more potters. Don mentioned um, blue corn. She's generally uh, acknowledged for reintroducing polychrome pottery. Unfortunately, we know very little about her career. Um, she was, and by the way, um, here's Maria and Julian giving instruction in pottery, and here's little blue corn, this little girl right here. Um, probably in uh, around 1930 or so. Um, she, we know very little about her career. Um, we don't know when she started making polychrome pottery again. She grew up making black on black because that was what dominated the Pueblo when she was growing up. And this is also in the collections of Los Alamos Historical Society, a really wonderful um, large plate by Blue Corn. But what she's best known for is, is this. So uh, considering their predecessors really wild colors, greens, oranges, um, tan, um, sort of off-white colors. Um, and she and her husband, her, her husband, again, like with Maria was the painter, Santiago uh, Calabaza. He was from Kiwa Pueblo, um, but they also did some carving. See this carving here, this avenue is actually carved out in relief. Um, they tried micacia slips, they tried everything. So she was really inventive. And as Don mentioned, this, this really kind of opened the door for other potters to start innovating again. And, and by this time um, in the 1950s, um, 1960s, Black on black pottery is already considered traditional. It's been around for several decades. And so there was kind of a new freedom to innovate uh, among potters with, uh, with both Popovi's polychrome and particularly with blue corn's polychrome. And here's a picture of blue corn later in life, uh, painting a big, a nice big plate. Okay. And then finally, we'll take a brief look at Popovi's son, Tony Day. So um, Tony was, um, he was first uh, a painter like his father and his grandfather. And Maria, like with Popovi, kind of got him interested in pottery. He lived with Maria as a very young child. And then again in his twenties, 
And Maria taught him pottery and he took it up. He was a very quick learner. He took it up, became very proficient, very, very fast. And he picked up some of his father's innovations. Um, and um, here you can see the black and Sienna. But there are two other things that Popovi did a tiny bit of that, that Tony really picked up on. And one is, is incising. And so these, these are not, these designs are not painted. They're actually incised and the lighter portions are what's stippled or incised into the, into the surface of the clay and leaving the rest of the polished pot, the design on the rest of the polished pot. And he just, that was his signature technique. He made it into an amazing, amazing art form. Um, he, he went for a brief time to um, Western New Mexico University and saw the Membrace pottery collection there. And he became infatuated with Membrace designs. And so he started incorporating those. So that was, a, that was the first big design as opposed to technique um, variation. Um, that, that Tony introduced. Um, but uh, in spite of, of picking up on these innovations, you know, in a minor way, um, Popovi was pretty hard on Tony in wanting him to adhere to the family tradition. And Tony felt really constrained by this. Uh, but Tony was only a few years into his pottery career when Popovi Day died in in 1971, uh, also fell victim to alcohol, unfortunately. Um, and after at that point, um, he felt freer to innovate, and he also moved more and more away from um, from life on the on the pueblo. Um, at, he moved to Santa Fe and Albuquerque, and then eventually to Colorado. And the what his desires took him toward was this extreme kind of surface decoration. He was still interested in form, but not as much. Um, he did innovate some animal forms, which, uh, which weren't totally new in Pueblo pottery, but they were at San Ildefonso. Uh, but you can see the extreme surface decoration, introducing stones, which Popovi did, um, but never really developed. He's got Zuni. He worked with Zuni um, lapidaries to, to do um, stone inlay. Um, combination of incising stone and, and you can see here heishi or very small shell bead work inlaid into the pottery. So he's got kind of all sorts of things going on here. There's more of combining these techniques. He started relief carving, uh, which is very new in Pueblo pottery. And he might have been the first, um, not 100% sure, but these are where the designs kind of rise up out of the surface. Um, so he was really driven to innovate. Um, he, he was an incredibly skilled potter, but he always had trouble with the polishing. And, um, and he, he, <laughs> he never learned how, he was never, never became proficient with firing. And so when his father was alive, his father fired his pottery and would get these nice gunmetal finishes. And his great aunt Clara would polish his pots, but his father died and then Clara just got too old to continue doing pottery. So the, much of the very last of Tony's production was matte pottery. And so here's just plain matte slips on pots. This one is probably rag polished where the, instead of just doing the painting, the paint is then wiped smooth with a cloth to get that, to get that kind of, to get that kind of finish. So it was very clear that Tony was, was really driven to um, to innovate, to create new designs. He was always looking for something new. So again, um, in conclusion, we'll go back to this idea of, of pottery styles as markers of cultural change. So in three generations, how do you get from this to this to this? So that's anonymous San, San Ildefonso polychrome. This is Marie and Julian, and this is Tony. And in three generations, that in, in, in the realm of craft, that's an enormous leap. Well, it, it's pretty clear that the degree of innovation parallels the degree of interaction of the Pueblo and Pueblo individuals with non-indigenous world. Um, Maria had the biggest transition to make um, as a, a young, very modest, probably quite shy Pueblo woman with very little contact with the outside world. Um, later in life, she came to really enjoy and embrace contact and she traveled a great deal. Um, 
to demonstrate pottery and to talk to, to dignitaries around the world. Uh, Popovi was, uh, of course, brought up in that environment. So he was a little bit, um, well, he was much more confident with the outside world. He moved very easily in it. He was, unlike Maria, who didn't speak English terribly well, he was extremely articulate in English, um, dealt with people very easily. And even though um, his wife, Anita, said that he felt a great deal of tension in straddling the two worlds, that he was very successful at doing it. Tony. Um, apparently was all in for everything new. And, and his pottery shows that, the way he lived his life shows that. Um, his son, Jared, said he was always interested in pursuing the quote unquote finer things in life. And he did with great gusto and in great intensity, in fact. In fact, to the degree that it often made him difficult to live with, according to his, his children. Um, but um, it was clear that these three innovators or these three groups of innovators um, were, were doing this on their own terms. There was some, um, there was some coercion from the market, um, but the good thing is the things they wanted to do were successful in the market. And, um, and so, um, so their, their innovation is pursued um, on their own terms, but still within the context of traditional craft. So they new designs in some cases like Tony, new techniques, um, but they were still rooted in, in traditional um, ways of, of making pottery, of gathering the clay, of preparing it and, and putting it together. So you can still see the, the pull of the dominant culture, particularly in the marketplace, um, but they're still their own people. So uh, Marie and Julian started out to help make a living during hard times. That was their motivation for getting into pottery for sale. Popovi continued and supported Maria's work knowing that his drive for technical perfection also would reap rewards in the marketplace. And Tony understood that relationship between technical ability and demands of collectors, but he was the one truly driven to innovate. So in three generations, again, we go, we go from from one set of definitions of quality to an entirely new and possibly Anglo-driven um, set of definitions to what degree um, they're innate rather than internalized, I think we'll probably never know. Um, but I think it's important um, to get a, a, a native perspective on this. And I would um, encourage at, in some future lectures to talk to somebody like um, Russell Sanchez or Kevin Gonzalez. Kevin is a great, great grandson of Maria, extremely excellent potters and get their perspective on, on, on these questions that I've raised because I don't have answers to them. So sorry to run over, that's, uh, that's the talk. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, we do have a couple, we have a que some questions if you, Anyone has a question, if you want to type it in the little chat box on your screen, we'll be happy to read it out loud to Michael. Um, before we start the questions, I just want to let people know, if you don't know, we do have a clay club here at Los Alamos the, through Fuller Lodge Art Center has a clay club. And if you're interested in pottery, um, definitely check out the Art Center, check out Clay Club. I don't know if anyone here is on in Clay Club, but um, there are plenty of people who um, would talk to you about that. So one question is um, for Julian, since he was a janitor at the museum, could he have been exposed to other designs like the Membrane's Feathers from his access to the collection there? Entirely possible. Um, I don't know if, if uh, because the, the museum was doing most of its research in, in northern New Mexico at the time, and then also in, in Mexico. I don't know if they had membrace potteries, but that's entirely possible. I just haven't been able to identify any specific um, prototypes or precedents for, for that design, but it's universally referred to as the membrace feather design. So we'll, <laughs> we'll go with that. Okay, let's see. Do we have any other questions? Um, if you have any other questions, you can type them in the chat. Um, 
I'm thankful and thank you to Don and Michael for including some pottery from our personal collection here on the Parido Plateau. The Los Alamos Historical Society archives is where those pieces of pottery are kept. And so I appreciate Don taking the time to take all the photographs of those and Michael to include some of that in your, your presentation to us. Do you know anything about the history of Maria signing her work or not signing it? Yes, I, just because of time, this is going to be long anyway, um, just because of time, I didn't include that. But, but Maria was apparently, and it was almost certainly true, uh, the first Pueblo potter to consistently sign her work. And she did that um, probably at the urging of either the Museum of New Mexico folks, or um, I think Marriott suggests that it was the director of the Indian school. Um, who suggested that. And that was because, um, because of her reputation was growing so rapidly. And so that it was easier to sell the pottery if it had her signature. She, um, she started by signing Marie. And again, Marie instead of Maria was probably a suggestion um, uh, from the Indian school uh, superintendent. Um, and she's probably started that around 1923. And then very quickly, she started signing Marie and Julian. And, um, and it was probably inconsistent about Marie versus Marie and Julian. By the late 1920s, it was consistently Marie and Julian. And then of course, till 1943, and then she signed Marie and Santana. And then just at the time when Santana was, was giving the work over to uh, Popo Vide, she started using her uh, her actual name, Marie A, ah, instead of Marie on the pots. And they were signed Marie Popovi. Popovi started signing um, toward the end of their work together and he started dating them as well. And then the, after Popovi died, uh, Maria continued and um, to make undecorated pots, which she signed Maria Povica, or actually she put the emphasis on the E, which is not the way Tewa is pronounced, but we don't know why she did that. <laughs> uh, but but anyway, so that's that's the signing history, and and there are some variations on those things. But but the wonderful thing about that is that from near the beginning of the black on black, and by the way, there are some polychrome things signed too. Um, but from the beginning of the black on black, or nearly the beginning, um, we uh, we have a we we can date the pottery because we know who the painter was and we know the date range in which they made it. So that's very, very useful. Do you know how long the firing process takes? Um, I, just a few hours, um, like three or so. Um, the, the, this is low fire pottery. Um, so the, the black gets induced at around 900 degrees. Um, and and what, what Julian discovered, um, which the which the, the, you know, the, the black pottery had been made forever at, at uh, Santa Clara and, and Okea Wenge. But what Julian discovered, which they apparently didn't know, is that um, if you fire at a lower temperature, you get that wonderful glossy finish that will start to dull if you fire at a higher temperature. And so it's, it's very low fire pottery. So if you, if you put a Maria pot in a bucket of water, it would, it would be gone in a, a week. Because it's low fire. Because it would just melt. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, several people say thank you for the lecture tonight. Fantastic lecture. Uh, someone asked this. I don't know if you know this. Is there still an eight northern Pueblos fair or festival in the summer? I don't No, the eight northern um, disappeared, oh, I'm thinking maybe six, eight years ago already. Which is really too bad. I was I was enjoyed going to it, and there were good makers there. Um, but so the you know so Indian Market, Santa Fe Indian Market is the main outlet, and then the I I I have never actually been to the Gallup Intertribal Ceremonial, um, so I don't know exactly who shows up there. But that is also a major source for for Native American arts. Yeah. Um, thank you so much. Great event, people say so. Thank you. Again, thank you. <laughs> thank you all for attending. Um, oh yeah, people say they really miss that fair too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
<laughs> so um, thank you all for attending our very first lecture of the season. We encourage you to come back next month for another lecture, and you can check out those out all those out on our website. Become a member of the Historical Society, volunteer, um, join our great community of people really caring about the history of Pajarito Plateau. Thank you, everyone, for coming, and thank you, Michael, for a wonderful start. Thank you. Appreciate thank you. the opportunity.